I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine channel on YouTube. Today we're continuing with the Psychic Bible, the apocryphal scriptures of Genesis Briar Peorage and the Third Mind of the Temple of Psychic Youth. Now, today's reading will be from an exceptionally long section of the book called Magic Defends Itself. Six. This is reading one nine. Because it's so long, I will be splitting it up over three days. Now we begin. The Hammer House of Horror interpretation of magic in Wicca is that curses and invocations are uttered by black-robed crones whilst they eat frogs and rat tails and drink bat's blood. In fact, so rare is the energy of pure, undiluted anger that the true mechanism of magical defense is missed. It is a frequency generated and transmitted just like a television signal. It does not need conscious direction. It hones in on the receptor by default. That is, they are consciously disconnected from the protection of the individual angered. This exposes them to the vagaries of a neurotic mass unconscious, and within that mass the anger still lurks. In a sense, magic is a Zen archer. By a combination of the initial pure anger and a second stage of disconnection, considered disinterest, it is able to defend itself by channeling a quote-unquote active truth. In simple terms, when you care for a person, or are closely involved with them in some way, and then they betray, abuse, or corrupt that caring, you remove your protection. When you remove your protection, they are once more open to those forces and pitfalls from which you protected them. A true curse is a technique of inaction and nonviolence from which we can perceive the effects of revenge without recourse to guilt on our part. Magic defends itself. It comes from intuition, is guided by will, and honors no gods, demons, spirits. It is the birthright of all human beings and the progeny of their brain, not some super being. Politicians and religious leaders of all persuasions hypocritically tell us otherwise. Believe none of them. Believe only your own experiences of life. To die free of guilt is to die pure, a star, and every man and woman is a star. Genesis Briar Peorage. And there's a section break. The art of not thinking, or those who do not. During the visit of Psychic TV in the Temple of Psychic Youth to Iceland, it was decided to arrange a truly pagan ritual blessing in the quote-unquote old religion's way, in a Satru ceremonial chanted saga. This was an amazing honor. The ritual was performed in sub-zero temperatures, out in the Icelandic wilderness beneath a huge statue of Thor rendered from an ancient standing stone that had been raised on a sacred spot thousands of years before. Caris was present. The magical community in Reykjavik that had arranged our visit to Iceland led by Hilmar Orn Hilmerson played pagan drums, Tibetan high thigh-bone trumpets, and Tibetan singing bowls to accompany the ceremony. The Asatru ritual was officiated by Svenbjorn Bintensen al Shuryagodi the only remaining Asachu priest from a direct bloodline of the past. For the first time, we felt closer to reclaim our pagan heritage and birthright and emasculating the imposed oppression of the sham that is bureaucratic Christianity. Section break. Not doing. Not doing is a means whereby things are made to happen and desires are made of flesh without conscious striving towards this or any other end. It involves maximal psychic force and minimal physical exertion, for the latter would inevitably blunt the spontaneity and thus make the apparently synchronistic manifestation impossible. Part of our programming consists of implanted value judgments that tell us what is possible and what is not. These programs serve the function of limiting our behavior and thus limit the amount of possibilities we have at our disposal. We have inherited and accumulated countless little blockages which restrict our flow in the world and which constantly send out their messages of quote-unquote you cannot, quote-unquote you should not, quote-unquote you do not deserve, quote-unquote it is not right, etc. These blocks will in the end thwart every healthy desire and end up by crippling the individual by divorcing him or her from the inner reality which should be the wellspring of each sentient being. Not doing is a way of bypassing these blockages and its quote-unquote practice will effectively pave the way for the unconscious or psychic reality which is at the core of every individual. Its practice should not be forced. Section break. 
No Mysteries. Dreaming of the romance of loneliness and the adventure of sex, will it ever be resolved? Our culture guarantees disappointment. It thrives on dissatisfaction, a phallus on a string drawing us onwards. Completion is like a needle of junk. It thrills and dies, pagan blood. Our concern is self-professed and reconstructed heathens, godless and proud, is to become integrated on every level of consciousness and character. We are implicitly consumers exiled to a spiritual desert, where the planned obsolescence of sexuality slips through our grasping fingers like grains of time to consume us. Those grains of time are each one of us material manifestations living a brief moment as mortals before returning to the infinite consciousness that expresses its thoughts through us, making us a language of a kind, each individual letter, word, glyph, or punctuation. Yet here in this moment, our concern, self-professed, is to reconstruct. Our dream is to become integrated on every level of consciousness and character. No emotion spared. No end necessary. The illusion of climax as an end in itself revealed. The harnessing of tantric climax as the end of self revelationary. Psychic individuals believe that at the instant of orgasm, male or female, a hieroglyph symbolizing a desire, a path, or an awkwardness can be in the inner recesses of the mind. In what is commonly dubbed the subconscious mind, but which the T.O.P.I. sees as the real conscious mind. This act concentrates the entire individual upon contact with an achievement of their desire. The patterns our brains inherit program us. Observation and action and their cumulative effect through invocation are the process. We can internalize our program, transmit a desire, or receive a result. All orgasms on this record are real orgasms. All were achieved during conscious T.O.P.I. ritual to force the hand of chance by the priestess. The cover photo is taken at the precise moment of orgasm through a T.O.P.I. ritual. Each playing of the record constitutes the invocation, making the record itself a hieroglyph or sigil of a specific desire. The record becomes a record document in talisman. Its playing becomes a form of reincarnation. The spiral spins a spiritual reconciliation of male as priest as dominant energy with his true role as submissive slave or chariot to the female as high priestess. A willing sacrifice recognizes the secret wisdom symbolized by the crucifixion. She lines up towards the light born under the back of he who can only rise by this complete surrender. The resolution of this adjustment in potency by the lovers is the only path across the abyss to the star. The sex moves, it groans, and there really is nothing left but the exploration of revelations. The priest is both slave and priest, priest and slave. It is her e-domination. No emotion spared, no end in sight. There are no demons or gods, no mysteries. Genesis Briar Peorage with Hilmar Orn Hilmerson. Section Break. The Splinter Test It can be said, for me at least, that sampling, looping, and reassembling both found materials and site-specific sounds selected for precision of relevance to the message implications of a piece of music or a transmedia exploration is an alchemical, even magical phenomenon. No matter how short or apparently unrecognizable a sample might be in linear time perception, I believe it must inevitably contain within it, and accessible through it, the sum total of absolutely everything its original context represented, communicated, or touched in any way. On top of this, it must also implicitly include the sum total of every individual in any way connected with its introduction and construction within the original host culture, and every subsequent mutated or engineered culture it in any way means or form has contact with forever, in past, present, future, and quantum time zones. Any two particles that have once been in contact will continue to act as though they are informationally connected regardless of their separation in space and time. That's Bell's theorem. Let us assume, then, that every thing is interconnected, interactive, interfaced, and intercultural. Sampling is always experimental in that the potential results are not a given. We are splintering consensual realities to test their substance, utilizing the tools of collision, collage, composition, decomposition, progression systems, random chance, juxtaposition, cut-ups, hyperdelic vision, and any other method available that melts linear conceptions and reveals holographic webs and fresh spaces. As we travel in every direction simultaneously, the digital highways of our futures, the splinter test, is both a highly creative contemporary channel of conscious and creative substance abuse and a protection against the restrictive depletion of our archaic, algebraic, analogic manifestations. 
My prophet is a fool with his one one one. Are they not the ox in none by the book? Liber all I forty eight. So in this sense, in bearing, this is our mind on a technical level. When we sample, or as we shall prefer to label it in this essay, when we splinter, we are actually splintering people and brain product freed of any of the implicit restraints or restrictions of the five dimensions. We are actually taking bites and reusing these thereafter as hieroglyphs or memes, the tips of each iceberg. If we shatter and scatter a hologram, we will realize that in each fragment, no matter how small, large, or irregular, we will see the whole hologram. This is an incredibly significant phenomenon. It has always been my personal contention that if we take, for example, a splinter of John Lennon, that splinter will, in every real manner, contain within it everything that John Lennon ever experienced, everything that John Lennon ever said, composed, write, drew, or expressed, Everyone that ever knew John Lennon, in the sum total of all, in any of those interactions, that everyone who have ever heard, read, thought of, saw, reacted to John Lennon, or anything remotely connected with John Lennon, every past, present, and or future combination of any or all of the above. In magic, this is known as the contagion theory, or phenomenon. The magical observation of this same phenomenon would suggest that by including even a minuscule reference or symbol of John Lennon in a working ritual or sigil, a two- or three-dimensional product invoking a clear intention, usually primarily geographically and non-linguistically in a linear or everyday sense, you are invoking John Lennon-ness as part of what is in this particular context, i.e. music, is a music, a musical sigil. All that encyclopedic information and the time travel connected with it, through memory and through previous experience, goes with that one splinter of memory, and we should be very aware that it carries with it an infinite sequence of connections and progressions through time and space, as far as you may wish to go. We can now all maintain the ability to assemble via these splinters clusters of any era. These clusters are basically reminding us. They are actually bypassing the usual nonsensus reality filters because they reside in an acceptable form, i.e. TV, film, music, words, and traveling directly into historical sections of the brain, triggering all in every conscious and unconscious reverberation to do with that one splinter hieroglyph. We access every variable memory, library and every individual human being who's ever for a second connected with conceived or related to or been devoted to or despised in any way been exposed to this splinter of culture we now have available to us as a species really for the first time in history infinite freedom to choose and assemble and everything we assemble is a portrait of what we now or what we visualize being skill for splintering can generate manifestation this is the quote-unquote splinter test we are choosing splinters consciously and unconsciously to represent our own mimetic DNA patterns, our own cultural imprints and aspirations. We are in a truly magical sense invoking manifestations, perhaps even results, in order to confound and short-circuit our perceptions in reliance of wholeness. Anything in any medium imaginable from any culture which is in any way recorded and can in any way be possible be played back is now accessible and infinitely malleable and usable to any artist. Everything is available, everything is free, and everything is permitted. It is a firestorm in a shop sale where everything must go. The edit and video and televisual programming and construction is in essence an invisible language in the sense that our brain reads a story or narration in a linear manner, tending to blend, compose, and assemble as continuous what it primarily sees at the expense of reading the secondary sets of intersections and joins that it does not consciously or independently see. Yet the precision of choice is in where to edit, and the specific emotional and intellectual impact and innate sense of meaning that is thus specifically conveyed is as much a text of intent and directed meaning, even propaganda, as is the screenplay or dialogue itself. Everything in life is a cut-up. Our senses retrieve infinite chaotic vortices of information, flattening and filtering them to a point that enables commonplace activity to take place within a specific cultural nonsensus reality. Our brain includes flux and builds a mean average picture at any given time. Editing, reduction of intensity, and linearity are constantly imposed upon the ineffable to facilitate ease of basic communication and survival. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we touch, what we emote, what we utter are all dulled and smooth approximations of a far more intense fiber in kaleidoscopic ultra-dimensional actuality. Those who build assemble. Assembly is the invisible language of our time. Infinite choices of reality are the gifts of quote-unquote software to our children. The Splinter Test, Appendix A. The Scattering. 
And they did offer sacrifices of their own blood, sometimes cutting themselves around in pieces, and they left them in this way as a sign. Other times they pierced their cheeks, at other their lower lips. Sometimes they scarified certain parts of their bodies, at others they pierced their tongues in a slanting direction from side to side, and passed bits of straw through the holes with horrible suffering. Others slit the superfluous part of their virile member, and leaving it as they did their ears. A Formal Process of Moral Reasoning if history is in any clue, the succession of civilizations is accomplished by bloodshed, disasters, and other tragedies. Our moral responsibility is not to stop a future, but to shape it, to channel our destiny in humane directions, and to try to ease the trauma of transition. We are still at the beginning of exploring our tiny little piece of the omniverse. We are still scientific, technological, and cyberspace primitives. And as we revolutionize science itself, expanding its parameters, we will put mechanistic science, which is highly useful for building bridges or making automobiles, in its limited place. Alongside it, we will develop multiple metaphors, alternative principles of evidence, new logias, catastrophe theories, and new tribal ways to separate our useful functions and archetypes from useless ones. The scattered shapes of this new civilization will be determined by population and resource trends, by military factors, by value changes, by behavioral speculations in fields of consciousness, by changes in family structures, by global political shifts, by awakened individual utopian aspirations, by accelerated cultural paradigms, and not by technologies alone. This will mean designing new institutions for controlling our technological leaps into a future. It will mean replacing obsolete political, economic, territorial, and ecological structures. It will mean evolving new micro-decision-making systems that are both individually and tribally oriented, synthesizing participation and initiation, and new macro-decisions-making systems that are digitally spiritual and revealingly autonomous. Small elites can no longer make major technological, ecological, or economical decisions. Fractally anarchic clusters of individuals with integrated extended family structures and transhuman gender groupings must participate and calibrate what stretches out before them in a neo-pagan assimilation of all before now and to be. It will be because IT is inevitable. Old T.O.P.I. proverb. We plow the field and scatter the wood chip of our plan. The Splinter Test, Appendix B. Source are rare. In the future, the spoken word will be viewed as holding no power or resonance, and the written world will be viewed as dead, only able to be imbued with potential life in its functional interactions with what will have become archaic software and programming archaeologies, namely speech. That is, just as a symphony orchestra preserves a museum of music, of music considered seminal and part of a DNA-like spiral of culture. So the word will be seen as the preservation vehicle in a DNA-like chain of digital breakthroughs and in cultural intersections. The word will be viewed not as a virus that gave speech, nor as the gift of organic psychedelics through which civilization, i.e. living in cities, was made so wondrously possible, but as a necessary language skill for those specializing in the arcane science of software archaeology, or soft arch processing, as it will become known. In much the same way as Latin was for so long a required subject and qualifier of scholarship at prestigious universities when the drone majority found it incongruous, if not ludicrous. Of course, individuals will be utilizing laser-based systems to access and exit the neurosystem via the retina, and these systems, in turn, will transmit wirelessly to a new breed of computers using liquid memory instead of microchips. If we are to disbelieve what we don't f hear, then conversation will be a status symbol of the leisured classes and power elites. As ever, the same processes that delineate power in this case, a perpetuation of an atrophied communication system, i.e. words, will always be appropriated by those whose position their means of perception at an intersection diametrically opposed to those who oppress with it, for it, or because of it. Put simply, any form of literal or cultural weapon pioneered by authority will someday be used by esoterrorists, esoterri bent upon destabilizing and or at least temporarily destroying its source. The poles become clearer, thine enemy more known, as the mud settles, the golden section invisible to all who would disown and destroy us. It is in this spirit that this work was created." Imagine, if you won't, that you are a subversive in this future. You conspire to be hidden by the use of the word. This act could move you into a position of becoming a co-conspirator in the process of desecration. To conspire literally means to breathe together. 
The all-pervading surveillance systems are now so digitized that they have no voice recognition software. This has also been manifested to protect the conspiracies and debaucheries of the control species themselves. Hell, even deities need privacy, son. We used to plot murderers and take overs in saunas, then bug-proof buildings. Now we just talk, son. No one out there listening, all just plugged in. One fashionable lower-class blue-collar medical expense is the vocal cord removal process. It's taken a status operation, a clear signal to one's contemporaries that your software interface is so advanced that you need never consider the use of speech ever again. The word is finally atrophied, no longer a dying art but dead. The bypass is on, so here you are. You feel something is out of balance. You talk. They talk. The world swims in silence. The only place of secrecy is a public place. The only manner of passing on secrets is talking out loud. Neither protagonist is aware that the other is talking. If they were, all hells would be let loose. Forcible vocotomies in the streets, subversive cell down at gunpoint, their cords lasered out in seconds, loud laughter of a rich vocotomy tout, the ultimate status signal of power. No, the word is gone, its power diffused, diffuse, in order that these scriptures of the golden eternity be fulfilled. In the ending was the word. As a recipient of this cluster, you are encouraged to recall and remain constantly vigilant of the dilemma it exposes. It hungers for the death of the word. Rightly so, for we are imprisoned in the naming sorcery that was both built and solidified within the process of control and more critically and integral to its submission and subservience. This death is craved intrinsically by all in order that a showdown may occur as the world preset guardians laser burn their retina of lust for result. The word wills to go. It is here to go. The brain-computer interface will replace all verbal media of communication. For better or wor wars, the new being merely that which is inevitable. Nurse it along so that it may become a living intelligence system, the museum of meanings. What wills to be reborn varies with the input of the user. Debug the old preset programming. Leave only an empty time zone that might you might delete later. Fill with your will and clarity of intent. The Splinter Test Appendix C cathedral engine video is the electronic molotov cocktail of the television generation cause the cathedral tubes to resonate and explode you are your own screen you own your own screen watching television parches us into the global mixing board within which we are all equally capable of being victim or perpetrator the internet carrying Audio, video, text, pictures, data, and scrapbooks via modem actually delivers a rush of potentiality that was previously only advanced speculation. The lines on the television screen become a shimmering representation of the infinite phone lines that transmit and receive. We have an unlimited situation. Our reality is already half video. In this hallucinatory state, all realities are equal. Television was developed to impose a generic unity of purpose the purpose of control. To do this, it actually transmits through lines and frequencies of light. Light only accelerates what the brain is. Now we can, with our brains, edit, record, adjust, assemble, and transmit our deepest convictions, our most mundane parables. Nothing is true, all is transmitted. The brain exists to make matter of an idea. Television exists to transmit the brain. Nothing can exist that we do not believe in. At these times, consciousness is not centered in the world of form. It is experiencing the world of content. The means of perception wills to become the program. The program wills to become power. The world of form wills to thereby reduce the ratio of subjective experiential reality. A poor connection between mind and brain. Clusters of temporary autonomous programs, globally transmitted, received, exchanged, and jammed, will generate a liberation from consumer forms and linear scripts and make a splinter test of equal realities in a mass political hallucination transcending time, body, or place. All hallucinations are real, but some hallucinations are more real than others. We create programs and deities, entities and Armageddons in the following way. Once we describe or transmit in any way our description of an idea, or an observed or an aspired to ideal, or any other concept that for ease of explanation we hereafter will to describe as a deity, we are the source of it. We are the source of all that we invoke. What we define and describe exists through our choosing to describe it. By continued and repeated description of its parameters and natures, we animate it. We give it life. 
At first, we control what we transmit. As more and more individuals begin in the origi- believe in the original sin of its description and agree on the terms of linguistic visuals and other qualities, this deity is physically manifested. The more belief accrued, the more physically present the deity wills to become. At a certain point, as countless people believe in and give life to that describe and believe in, the deity wills to separate itself from the source and then develops an agenda of its own, sometimes in opposition to the original intent and purpose of the source. The general order at this intersection becomes geo go and it continues to transmit to our brains our brains are thus a neurovisual screen for that which has separated from its source and become a deity this is in no way intended as a metaphor rather a speculation as to the manner in which our various concepts of brain are actually programmed and replicated in an omniverse where all is true and everything is recorded as brian jason wondered who made the original recordings or in more contemporary jargon who programmed the nanotech software Our response can only be a speculative presence. The guardians who exist in an at present unfathomable under other world. I repeat myself. The guardians who exist in an at present unfathomable other world and precept the transmissions in some as yet mysterious way. Videos can move televisual order and conditioned expectations of perspective from one place and reassemble its elements as if gluing a smashed hologram back together all the while knowing that each piece contains within it the whole image. In other words, these are all small fragments of how each of us actually experiences life, through all our senses simultaneously, in every direction simultaneously, even in all five dimensions at least simultaneously, bombarded by every possible nuance and contradiction of meaning simultaneously, qua qua versally. This is relentlessly inclusive process. We do not just view life anymore, although perhaps we can at least potentially have an option to view any everything. Intention is the key. What was once referred to as viewer is now also a source of anything to be viewed and the neurovisual screen on which to view it. The constructed and ever-increasing digital concoction built from millions of sources that is commonly referred to as cyberspace is accelerating towards deification and separateness towards the moment of a sentient awakening of its own consciousness and agendas that we feel is more aptly described as the psychosphere. This psychosphere challenges us to seize the means of perception and remain the source. Change the way to perceive and change all memory. Old T.O.P.I. proverb. The Splinter Test, Appendix D. Since there is no goal to this operation, other than the goal of perpetually discovering new forms and new ways of perceiving, it is an infinite game. An infinite game is played for the purpose of continuing to play, as opposed to the finite game which is played for the purpose of winning or defining winners. It is an act of freed will. No one can play who is forced to play. Play is indeed implicitly voluntary. The Splinter Test, Appendix E. The night under witches that you close up your book of shadows and open up your neuro superhighway to the liquid blackness within which dwells an entity represents the edge of present time. It pinpoints precisely the finality of all calendars wherein it is clear that measurement in itself and of itself equals death or doth. The spoken binds and constricts navigation unutterably. The etymology of the word spiral DNA from the Greek indicates an infinitude of perceptive spaces and points of observation where down, up, across distance, and other faded directional terms become redundant in an absolute elsewhere. The eyes have it, and they suggest a serpent that was once the nearest metaphor to cold, dark matters such as wormholes and spaces in between. Genesis, Briar Peorage. 1991 and there is a section break behavioral cut-ups and magic one the key my primary concerns in space and time that situation which society informs us is named being alive or on more intellectual days or reality are control human behavior, and an inkling that underlying everything is a web of parallel causes and parallel effects upon which we can exert more manipulative pressure than we are led to believe by the aforementioned society. Whilst it is true that we did not ask to be here, it is also true that we did not ask to to not be here either. 
Birth and death at this stage of evolution appears to our everyday senses to be the only certain points of this maelstrom of being alive. Being is such a nice word. To be, to be in, being, a state of mind or body. It is a rather comforting and seductive word. Yet, like all words, it has reverberations. Languages interfacing, wars and migrations cross-fertilizing, instinctual needs to do more than grunt, urges to express more than biological functions and prerequisites. History, that which travels the macrocosm of space and time, lives inside words like an ectoplasmic hermit crab in a stolen shell. Words, in turn, live inside us, too, like more hermit crabs, protecting themselves from discovery of their secret. And words live outside us, free-ranging in our culture like viruses waiting for an appropriate host. This function has been deeply investigated by W.S. Burroughs in literature, and to a lesser extent, through tape, film, and collage works earlier in his career. However, looking back, this first layer and its direct symbiotic relationship with all interpretations of control and all the interactions and permutations it exposes satisfied him and occupied him enough. Brian Jason, quote unquote, the master, who largely introduced Burroughs to this whole scenario, saw further, saw the other layers, was not satisfied. He studied languages, Western and Eastern etymology had devastating knowledge of European migrations and interactions going back as far as records allowed. He was aware of the process touched upon earlier. He observed firsthand for 23 years the threads of pulse and frequency generated through Moroccan music. Where the master musician has certain phrases and sequences of sound that are the equivalent of a spoken language and guide and instruct the players as the music is performed. Music that therefore literally speaks of primal roots and impulses of behavior. That triggers endorphin-assisted alpha-wave neurological states that inspire and reveal the fluidity of occult physics. That all is light, which is nothing more than an idea, and that light is within that infinite particles exploding and racing in every direction simultaneously, a qua-qua versatility, and that is the nearest to a key we might get. Editor's note, and I might add and instantaneously to the perception of the light itself. Moving on. And from this, Brian gave us paintings and drawings which began with the desert, with desert light, and then seemed at first glance to become more abstract, myriad scratchings and markings, swirling until he showed you they were the desert still, the light itself, the very particles of sight. And they were the desert dwellers, the keepers of the music, the speakers of frequency, the expressions of magical lore, the inhabitants of Pan, drowning in unspoken rituals. 2. The Door in relation to this event and its primary concerns, the door is the cut-up. There is now a clear representation of the system that concerns us. Contrary to the image we are presented with by those feudal overlords that administer control, our society is not yet part of the 21st century or even the 20th in terms of its common structure and behavioral inhibitors. The great majority of people are, to all intents and purposes, quote-unquote, serfs. And they exist on the minimum level of potentiality expansion at which they can function to perpetuate the status quo. No one conglomerate of businessmen, politicians, or Masonic manipulators controls control. They do, however, administer its needs. It's an obvious truism that most injustices in our society are protections of the vested interests of a minority over the majority. For hundreds of years, the majority of the population have been bullied, conditioned, trained, suppressed, and censored into subservience. Into an unconscious yet massively potent acceptance of the impossibility of an evolutionary change in human behavior patterns and the impossibility of aspiring to the maximum growth and repossession of their own innate potential. Control is the web that traps us and injures our intuitive belief in ourselves. The word literature parallels this process. With a cut-up, you can break down the expected inherited values and assumptions and retrain yourself to look at revealing possibilities, describing reality more accurately than any linear system. Our languages are linear. Life is not. At any given moment, we are receiving input to the exteroceptors, both in obvious ways and in less obvious ways, i.e. the sound enters our body through all its surfaces via vibration and frequency, not just the ears. These inputs contribute to motivation in the cerebral cortex. 
Simultaneously to this process, memories are being compared to the new information in the cerebral cortex, then modifies it and adds it to command for the subcortical regions. In those subcortical regions, effectors carry out the command response to the stimuli. While these neurological functions are taking place, the body continues its metabolic functions and actions semi-automatically. Random events outside the individual's body are also being registered and or affecting the individual. Emotions are triggering and interplaying in the unconscious. The entire nature and state of that individual is in a state of flux. There is no fixed point, no definition, no finite answer or specific formula. The closest to a possibility of describing the reality of things as opposed to the inherited linear materialistic model of the state of being alive has to be a kaleidoscopic integrated nonlinear method. It has to contain, at least implicitly, implicitly, every possibility, every impossibility, every conscious and unconscious thought, word and deed simultaneously. This cut-up is a practical way into this. Life is quite simply a stream of cut-ups on every level. Given the discovery of a means to describe and reveal reality, we can also identify control. Control denies intuition and instinct particularly, and dreams of all forms randomness thought. All these and other behavioral and psychological perceptions generate impulses in individuals to say why, to say no, to refuse acceptance, to believe more is possible than they have been literally led to believe, that they need nothing that they need accept nothing until they analyze and evaluate its value and applicableness to them. 3. The room. A room means to have space to grow and develop. It's also a physical place, and like all words, it is a metaphor too. The room is where you are and where you want to be. To go into the room is to choose to reclaim yourself. Until people learn to respect themselves again, to care for themselves, to treasure emotions and feelings... To have self-esteem and accept no one else's suggestion of what it is possible for them to be, what skills they ha might have, and how far those skills can be pushed, to always make up your own mind and about what is right for you, what has value to you in every aspect of life. To relearn as a new second nature to make up your own mind and not be directed, intimidated, or accepting of any established system of values and behavior. Until all these processes are returned to an individual's own control and constantly reanalyzed to check against laziness and habit for its own sake, there could be no possibility of evolution and expansion for the individual and through them society. What is needed, therefore, is a practical, functional method that effectively deconditions, disinhibits, and short-circuits of society's behavioral taboos and controls. A physical backup to the process of always asking why. Accepting nothing is true. It was this quest for a method that led me tor first towards performance art, within which context I attempted to set myself tasks that forced me to locate barriers and inhibitions related to pain and sexual thresholds, for example. Once I identified and measured, I was able to think about whether they were art actually useful to me or were merely inherited this regimen in turn introduced me to new mental states akin to trance and yoga and unexpected blocks or embarrassments that were illogical to me ritualization fused with impulse by most deeply buried and normally inarticulated drives and desires and an approach devoid of preconceptions that re-educated my idea of what i was as an individual what my real boundaries were and what it was possible for me to become what I had been bombarded with as my self-image by education, religion, society, family, and the media, in their various colluding forms, subtle and blatant, bore no relation to what I experienced and perceived. There were always levels beneath the level of what we identify as a problem. Suddenly I realized that ritual and various occult practices were in fact methods of short-circuiting control of the individual, destroying their compliance with which they are trained to expect, want, or aspire to. They were a parallel method in the medium of behavior and self-reclamation to the cut up in writing, film, video, and music. So cultural methods of decontrol could just as effectively be applied to ourselves. To more accurately describe both how we are at one point in time and how we can redefine ourselves from that point on. To be aware of all the simultaneous factors that must be clearly and honestly allowed, free play for us to work in a focused, accurate manner towards a fully integrated character that recognizes and embraces every aspect of its complex self, free of any self-delusion, that finds its own ratios and rationales with a com complete reintegration of the conscious and unconscious mind of sexuality, emotion, intelligence, knowledge, relationships, dreams, and so on. 
not just a developing of so-called logical perceptions, but a genuinely realistic blending of the illogical as well, that recognizes that nothing is fixed, that these ratios are forever changing and should be seen as directions. 4. The Person the person, therefore, could fight back, and a long-standing tradition of magic appeared the most relevant area and structure within which to research and express the possibilities open to individual and collective redefinition and evolution. As Burroughs said about cut-ups, how random is random? The picture we get from cut-ups is more accurate than any traditional description. What has always been presented as the irrational becomes far more accurate and plausible than the rational explanation we are endlessly urged and bullied to accept. The psychology of the unconscious explores the background of the so-called rational mind, both by disciplined investigation and hysterical disassociation of thought habits. There is a strong implication that the essence of magic is psychointegrative. It reinvests the individual with an awareness of psychogenetic history, lets them face and reevaluate their own responses and perceptions of themselves. It allows them to be awake and fight subservience and adherence to any and all preconceptions. The myths and symbols of the past were attempts to articulate intimations of what is possible. The themes of mythology are not just archaic knowledge. They are living actualities of human beings. They exist as signposts and facets of interlaced themes that together make up human behavior, character, aspiration, and potential. To touch ourselves and respect ourselves against all the odds is crucial to survival and to appreciation and effective use of the state of being alive. The need is to find a way into the deepest areas of the psyche and how it affects and triggers behaviors in response. To redevelop an integrated relationship with our so-called primitive perceptions from which we have been alienated by society. Western society has built a norm where, unthinkingly, the majority of people deny, ridicule, attack, abuse, trivialize, experience, fear of, suppression, or consign to novelty any experience and provide evidence or intimations of their inherited system of explanations being inadequate. Fact, whatever that is, is given credence over dreams. Acceptance by a group is paramount. Deviation and rebellion generate fear. Those with the courage to openly declare independence and hope are isolated and scorned. Fame is constantly projected as the primary motivation for ambition. Every level of our society is riddled with the concepts of competition, beating the other person or side. This is reinforced by capitalism, by sport, entertainment, religion, and politics. Compete, compete. Competition is a variant of aggression. By using ritual, gradually getting a clearer map of every interconnection of one's conscious and unconscious mind, and coming to terms with the revelation that co flux and constant change, with no anchors or reassuring formulae and no guaranteed rewards of salvation, one can liberate oneself from all the inherited constraints that nine times out of ten directly or indirectly bolster the status quo. It literally allows us to face ourselves and face facts. It supplies recognition that within each individual there are many types and shades of consciousness with diverse intentions and values. By investigating our blocks, inhibitions, real desires and motivations in preconceived moments of time, set aside to explore thresholds of perception in response to check exactly what one's limits are and decide if they are one's real limits or merely convenient or complacent, we can reassemble and discard as we wish. 5. The Idea To heal and reintegrate the human character To set off psychic detonations that negate control To reevaluate and value phenomena that appear to defy re reason To retrieve choice in all things To avoid separation and compartmentalism in every aspect and level of life, internal and external To always attempt to express as truly as you can what you really feel and think To locate and identify one's skills and develop them To be aware of human frailties and futility whilst caring intensely to push to the edge and struggle to always feel and express more. To despise all forms of complacency. To carry through one's ideas 24 hours a day for a lifetime. To accept nothing. To assume nothing. To encourage others to repossess themselves and maximize their potential. To exchange and liberate information. To understand and treasure the preciousness of feelings, emotions, and sentiment. To rebuild the parameters and possibilities of relationships. To locate and choose without guilt or fear one fear one's individual natural balance of sexuality, to change and not see change as contradiction or inconsistency, but actually how things are and should be, to see time as an unfixed and irreplaceable resource that one receives only a limited and unpredictable amount of, that the time must never be wasted or squandered, to try to work towards knowing that you used every second constructively, to seek self-improvement, not self-gratification. Control. Control needs time like a junkie needs junk. 
Time appears linear. Cut-ups make time arbitrary, nonlinear. They reveal, locate, and negate control. Control hides in social structures like politics, religion, education, and mass media. Control exists like a virus for its own sake. Cut-ups loosen rational order, break preconceptions, and expected response. They retrain our perception and acceptance of what we are told is the nature of reality. They confound and short-circuit control. All control ultimately relies upon manipulation of behavior. In culture, the cut-up is still a modification of or an alternate language. It can reveal, describe, and measure control. It can do damage, but that is not enough. Magic as a method is a cut-up process that goes further than description. It is infused with emotion, intuition, instinct, and impulse, and includes emotions and feelings. It operates actually within the same medium, behavior, as control. It is therefore essentially as a system to challenge emasculate and render impotent the source of control itself. Control disintegrates, magic integrates. The idea is to apply the cut-up principle to behavior. The method is a contemporary, non-mystical interpretation of magic. The aim is reclamation of self-determination, conscious and unconscious to the individual. The result is to neutralize and challenge the essence of social control. Genesis Briar Peorage, London, 1987. There's a section break. And that concludes section 1-9. Uh, editor's note. As I did mention, this is not the end of uh, this particular book, Magic Defends Itself, Part 6. Uh, this is just the first third of it. But we've gone on for a long time today, and so I will likely wrap this up. I do want to add this, though. Uh, my understanding of this, these chapters that I've read is basically this, that there is a whole medium of understanding out there especially in starting with television, going on to video, and eventually the internet, that is the mechanism of visual language. And I believe what Genesis is saying here is that this visual language interacts with us subliminally, even more intensely than words do, and we rely on words for virtually everything. So she's saying that she chooses to use the cut-up, or what we would call sampling nowadays, as a means of reordering these visual and audio uh, language and snippets, what we call memes nowadays. And it's a way of subver subverting control because what she's kind of saying is that even in things that have already been written, even in television programs that have already been put on TV, even in internet posts that have already been published, you don't have to accept exactly what it says because you could always take that, chop it up, and put it in a different direction, and then it's yours again. So magic is not only the uh, effective manifestation of your own words and your own vision and your own visuals and your own internet posts, etc., etc., etc. Magic can also be taking what someone else put and just cutting it up because then it becomes yours again. And that's the essence of the cut-up, which is what she's talking about with with, um, with sampling. Now, I think she's also talking about the future and what the future of media will be and communication will be in a time when we integrate mechanically with one another, if that ever happens, and I believe it will, um, where even in that far distant future of perfect communication between brains and images and, and, and so on and words, you will still have the cut up. You'll still have this individual ability to take what is put in you and slice it to pieces and make it your own. Because the point in all this is the freeing of the individual from social constraint and finding methods, always finding new methods of getting rid of that, for, that social control which comes from all these different forces. And uh, embracing the danger of true individuality. Not capitalist individuality of, of by, by the thing that makes you you. Real individuality of create the meaning that makes you you and thereby create yourself. And damn the torpedoes. And fuck the torpedoes and whatever happens happens because we're supposed to be free so that's my personal take on what i just read and i want to hear your take too if you want to write it in the comments so tomorrow we'll continue with part six magic defense itself in section 110 but for now have a good night